thing. So this is a program developed by the Kauffman Foundation to engage and connect entrepreneurs. So this is a national program. It's happening all over the country in different cities today at 9 a.m. So connect via Twitter. Um, one Million Cups Little Rock is our Twitter handle or just One Million Cups. Use the hashtag 1MC to connect with other people. Feel free to tweet about this the whole time. Engage over social media. Um, so our first presenter of the day is Drone Surveying Solutions. They are a graduate of the pre-accelerator program of the Venture Center and last week won $25,000 of the Governor's Cup. They can talk to us more about that. But the format of this is a six-minute story from the entrepreneur, 20-minute Q&A. So if you have questions, feel free to write them down or remember them. And then afterward, we'll have a big discussion Q&A. We have two presenters this morning. But let's go ahead and welcome Drone Surveying Solutions. brought me on in sales and marketing. Now I'm with RQAB and these are drone surveying solutions. This is Brad Foster, our CEO. You want to give him a little bit of your background? Yeah, so um, about two years ago I started RQAV and we went through the tech launch program at Euler. And during that tech launch program we worked with the mechanical engineering department to create a drone and a spray rig that could do these kinds of things that we're about to go through. That tech launch uh, was successful. That program was very successful. We actually went to Montreal. We competed in the International Mechanical uh, Engineering Forum. And then uh, from there, got offered to go into the Governor's Cup. Um, when we went into the Governor's Cup, I met with uh, Bobby's team. I said, you know, this is, this is a, a great idea. I think y'all should run with it. Um, see what y'all can do with it. Because I didn't know how much traction I was really going to get as a company to do something like this. So they ran with it and made it an extremely successful venture, so. so. I'd like to start with a very simple graph depicting crop output in the United States over the last three years. The green bars represent the crops that were planted and the yellow bars represent the crops that actually made it to harvest. Now it's apparent when looking at this graph that the losses are monumental. Just to quantify that number, that's over 56 million acres that were lost. So the team came together to find a solution for this problem. And it's really simple, actually. That's actually our process. Survey, detect, and neutralize. We use a normalized difference vegetation index to detect nitrogen uptake in the plant. This is indicative of photosynthetic capacity. Essentially, it represents the plant's energy. Basically, light looks differently when it reflects off unhealthy plants as opposed to your healthy plants. This is how we find the problem areas. In case you're wondering what this looks like in a real world application, here's an example of our NDVI being put to use. A good way to look at it is green dense good, red lacking density is bad. So once we have found these problem areas, we can then go back to neutralize the issue with our patented spring device. So when crop dusters or aero applicators release, they release 6 to 30 feet up. Our UAVs release 2 to 6 inches up, effectively reducing driftage associated with cost illegalities that cause chemical trespassing and severe damage to the local wildlife. We can reduce this driftage by about 95%. Brad's going to go into a more in-depth analysis of the NDVI. So this is pretty typical. You know, when we first started this, we actually met with several crop consultants and they were like, you know, we're already getting a lot of this NVDI um, information from satellites. And I said, well, a, a, a UAV can get a lot closer, can get a lot more detail. Um, when you when you see a, a a map like this, what the, what the satellite's gonna give the crop consultant is gonna be a block. Hey, you have problems here and you have problems here. He's not gonna tell you, hey, you got this problem here, this problem here, this problem here. It's not gonna be defined to each individual plant. When a UAV becomes involved, you can get very specific and you can get down to the each individual plant. So the data we collect is our biggest weapon in combating crop loss. It's essential. So here's a simple depiction of the data flow for our QAB. Here's how it works. We show up every day, same day, every week, and we assess and deliver the data on site. We deliver it within 45 minutes of collecting it so the farmer can start neutralizing their issues as soon as possible. We then back up the data on our QAB hard drive so it's secure, and then we create a report of the crop data, data as a PDF. These reports are crucial because they show trends that we can compare week to week, month to month, year to year. We then go back, deliver the prior week's report, and then repeat the whole process. 
Right now, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the market. There are 49,000 farms in Arkansas. Our goal is to capture 1.7% or 868 farms. By the end of our first five years, we plan to have 53,000 acres treated. Our average annual revenue per customer will be just over $1,400, and our average annual revenue per acre will be $116. Talk about some other ones. So, so this doesn't just stop with uh, doing NDVI. Um, the vegetation index is great for agriculture. But when you start looking at UAVs and some of the other things that we're already engaged in is feral hog detection. There's, you know, one, one group of hogs can take out 40 acres of newly planted crop a, year, uh, a day in one night. Um, we're working right now with Game and Fish and a couple of consultants right now to do feral hog detection. I'm actually flying tonight and tomorrow night looking for hogs. Irrigation. We can we can actually do a better hydrology study than, than most people because we have LIDAR and we have hyperspectral sensors that can tell us exactly where the water is going and how fast it's moving that way. Um, timber assessments. Timber assessments, you know, just like NDVI, um, we can we can measure the actual crop canopy. We can tell them, hey, this area of the of your timber is ready to be harvested as soon as possible, or this area of timber actually has bores and needs to be removed. Um, pipeline leak detection. A lot of that goes back to hyperspectral and thermal sensors. The same thing that we're using for feral hog and irrigation. Um, but you can fly over a pipeline and you can detect the leak very easily. And we're actually working right now with a company out of Beaumont, Texas called ICI to develop a thermal that can detect natural gas leak in the air. So you can actually see the plume of gas as it's leaking. And then landfills. I start, uh, I start flying for landfills this weekend uh, doing LIDAR. That gives them a volumetric uh, an ability to measure volumetric, volumetric uh, increases in the land as they as they build the landfill. So they, they can actually produce, we produce three-dimensional models with these kinds of technology, and they can produce one with their landfill for better future planning. So that's our pitch. A couple more things. <laughs> right now, the regulatory climate is in favor for UAVs and agriculture. Up until so now, you cannot use UAVs to collect revenue. Yeah, now you can. You just need a simple 333 incentive to really obtain that. There's currently a 5.7% projected annual growth rate for UAVs in agriculture, and there are just under 1,500 businesses somehow involved in UAVs across America. UAVs in agriculture is in the early stage of growth, and we need customer acquisition, and many other opportunities are wide open for us. While we're on opportunities, the Agricultural Act of 2014 is a bill that was passed as directly meant to help farmers gain and implement capital, specifically in precision agriculture. So to recap, we have a crop, high expenses for farmers, and crop loss. We have a solution, our UAVs and our patent spraying device, and we have a way for the consumer to engage and pay for it. Around 85% of the farms in the state are applicable to this. We have an opportunity. Any questions? Hi, I'm Joe Calhoun. Uh, your, your spraying device, what's, what's the payload on that? I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't clear we have uh, we have UAVs that can carry that have 128 pounds of thrust right now. So um, we have some that can carry you or him or probably both of you at the same time if we got the engineers involved. Um, the thing is, is the FAA is going to regulate us down to 55 pounds. So anything under 55 pounds, we don't have to go to the FAA and ask for special approval to use. Anything above 55 pounds, we have to go through what's called an FAA airworthiness test, and at that point, we become um, a little more regulated. But it's not out of the realm of possibilities. Um, but under 55 pounds, so this actual the, the actual unit that we designed for this is a 25 pound drone and the uh, it, it runs a three and a half gallon tanks. Um, each tank runs off 4,000 PSI. So you're not spraying, you're fogging. You're hitting it with a, a really high pressure fog that uh, it's designed to go 100 foot in diameter. So if you think about a field and you have one spot, you figure out where that one spot is, is Say, say you have spider mites. That one spot of spider mites is starting to explode. If you let it go, it's going to take over acre upon acre. If you can get out there and control that one spot with this, with this kind of technology, then you've, you've saved yourself from spraying the whole field. Each tank covers one acre. The way we're doing preventative maintenance, we're not going to be covering large areas. We're going to find a problem area. We're going to catch it early on. We're going to neutralize it. So it's really for problem areas, not to replace crop dusting as in function. Absolutely. It's, it's well... I would say that it is to control the spots that will require crop dusting later on if they're not go if they go untreated. 
So, so that follows in with my question. This is Chris Atkinson. Um, I did meet, or actually had lunch with a crop dust uh, crop dusting guy recently, and he wasn't really concerned about this kind of stuff. And I was like, I could see this taking over for what y'all do. Is it a complimentary thing, or is the growth plan to how do, how does the pricing compare per acre for spraying and and that kind of stuff? actually still recommend they do a crop dust to come out at least once or twice a season for that massive and there are certain things that crop dusters will always be required to do. Um, you know, in rice, you have zinc EDTA that's required. Um, you can't do that with one of these. You're going to have to, you're going to have to spray the whole field. Hey, just to follow on, keep getting nerdy on the uh, drones itself, but so what's the battery life? So what kind of flight time do you have? And then, you know, on average, what's the expense for one of these devices? Um, well, flight time is dependent upon weight. So as we spray, we're going to get a little more flight time. Right now on a 50-pound uh, system, we can get about 12 minutes. So it's going to move fast. Um, but these systems can get up in the air. They can go 65 miles an hour to a spot spray, go 65 miles an hour to a spot spray. I mean, they're, they're moving fast. Um, and it's all robotically controlled. So everything is robotic. Um, uh, as far as what was the second one? How much? How, each system... I would say a system like this is going to run about fifteen to twenty thousand dollars when it's all said and done. Also, we're offering this as a service mm -hmm. that allows us to get in there with penetration. They're not buying the product themselves. Uh, the FAA won't allow them to. If if a farmer were to use this for spraying, then he would fall under commercial use of a UAV and therefore would be required to have a 333 exemption. It took me two years to get mine. Most farmers aren't going to want to go through those regulatory hurdles. Oh, yes. We, we use redundant GPSs, so we don't rely on one GPS system ever. So. Chuck? Brad, Brad, back to, back to the, the farmer. So the farmer, if his load is less than 55 pounds, does he still have to have the 333 permit? Yes. Okay. So you have to have the 333 permit to spray any type of... You have to have a 333 permit. You have to have a 333 exemption under the Department of Transportation, which falls under the FAA, for any commercial use of a UAV. Even if you're doing it on your farm? Even if you're doing it on your farm. <laughs> Even if you fly a, a UAV over your farm to look at your crop. It's considered commercial use at that point and needs to fall under the 333. The, I met with my FAA regulator the other day, and he says he's starting to go after farmers now for that very reason. I said, come on, man. There's no reason for that. You know, I mean, you got to let people fly, you know, over their own fields, and they're not, they're not budging. So. so do you only do pestis pesticides? Is it only pest infestation, or what else might you Micronutrient deficiencies. You know, if you can find a spot for micronutrient deficiencies, easily load this with some kind of EDTA micronutrient mix and, and so do you it. have you done that or is that just something that most can be theoretical done? most of this is theoretical now we've done a couple of tests we've destroyed a couple of drones doing it um, but yes we've we've got a system that can actually do it now. that might be a great question how many drones have you destroyed in the process of you <laughs> uh, let's see for this one particular uh, I've done a lot of these by the way um, for this one particular one, I think I've gone through three drones. Uh, the one for the Department of uh, Defense, the Navy, I've gone through six. So, you know, it's, it's a lot of research, a lot of R&D. We have time for one more question before the next presenter. Question. Hi, uh, Dan Rhoda. What do you guys intend to uh, charge the farmers for the service? What's your pricing structure going to be like? $250 a month plus 20 cents. Good. So we end all presentations the same way, which is by asking you guys, what is one thing the community can do to help you? Give us money. We need money. What, what besides that can we do to help you? Um, we need shoulders. We need the right people to help push this stuff. This is such new technology that, you know, everybody has a, 
the reservations about it. You know, um, there's been a lot of fear of drones. There's been a lot of a lot of bad drone publicity in the in the news, and 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 we need it to change. We really do. We need people's attitudes about it to change. Good, great. Well, let's go ahead and give them a thank you. So our next presenter is Jaden Barnes. He is a student at Noble Impact. Um, yeah, so we have some students in the back. He's been learning about entrepreneurship, um, and he's so he is in high school right now. Just keep that in mind. It's amazing that he's going to get up here and do a presentation. He's a filmmaker, um, sort of working on his own venture right now. Um, while he's getting ready, one quick announcement for the rest of the day. There's no co-working here. Um, on Wednesday, normally we have co-working Wednesdays at the Venture Center, but none today. Um, we get do what? Any more announcements? Okay, we're going to go ahead and welcome Jaden. Um, so keep in mind again about Twitter, um, Facebook, and keep your questions for the end. Also, whenever you do have a question, we're going to bring the microphone to you because we're live streaming this. Um, so make sure that you wait for the microphone and then say who you are and, and where you're from and everything like that. Let's go ahead and welcome Jaden. Hey everybody, this feels weird, I'll let you know. So anyway, uh, my name is Jaden Barnes, I'm a filmmaker and visual effects artist. Uh, I do stuff for companies, I do stuff for myself. I also design, a uh, graphic designer, and I also do web and game development. So I do quite a bit. Um, so to start things off, uh, I'm going to kind of categorize this presentation in uh, chronological order. Uh, so it's going to have the start, the middle, and the future. So uh, I was born uh, uh, in Indiana, Evansville, and I moved to Arkansas shortly after. Now, um, at the time, I was very little. Uh, I uh, didn't live in a very nice neighborhood, um, and my mom kind of wanted me to kind of stay inside. And the, another reason was because allergies. Allergies suck. Uh, but um, anyway, staying inside a lot, I watched a lot of TV, like a lot of it. So uh, one of the things uh, is that whenever I'd watch a TV show when I was little, my parents would kind of think I would take that occupation that the show is about. So for example, I'd watch something like Bob the Builder. They'd think, oh, he wants to be an architect when he grows up. I'd watch something like Rescue Heroes. They'd be like, oh, well, I guess he wants to be a firefighter. And then I'd watch something like SpongeBob, and then my parents would worry about my future career. Uh, but yeah, so uh, this is uh, one of my old animations. This is when I was starting off, right? So I'd take uh, little frames of images and kind of move them. It's kind of frozen, apparently. But uh, yeah, so I'd take a picture, move the object a little more, take a picture. Uh, until you get sequential images like what you see. Uh, sorry for the lag, I don't know what's happening there. Um, and then from there, I went on to stop motion animation of Lego figures. So it's a little bit more complex than a little Lego, or a little clay dude. So uh, yeah, that was kind of an example of my early work. Um, yeah, so uh, on to the now. Uh, I currently have done a lot of stuff for previous clients, so I have something to kind of back me up a little bit. Um, I've done, uh, I created a short film called The Pop and Lock. Now, a little thing about this is that this is actually all 3D animation. None of what you're seeing is real. Uh, took about uh, six to seven months to make. It's about a one minute, two minute short, um, but it made it to film festival. It was the first fully CG uh, a 3D animated uh, film in Film Festival, uh, North Little Rock. So, on to the next one. I uh, created uh, kind of a logo intro uh, for a company called Game Salad. Now, if you don't know what Game Salad is, it's essentially uh, a company that lets you make games without having to write any code, which is pretty awesome. So, uh, definitely supported them. They asked me. I was like, all right, cool. So, that's another thing. 
Uh, lastly, uh, I did a, a 3D commercial and a website for a security company called Archangel. Uh, this is the commercial. Once again, all CG, nothing's real. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of what I've been doing lately, just kind of a taste of what I've been doing. There's the product. Um, so uh, this is what I'm capable of more specifically, right? So uh, this is uh, rigid and soft body physics. So basically, I can make things fall and look cool. Um, motion graphics, a lot of companies like to use this in their, in their kind of business presentation, showing what they're capable of in a very interesting way, right? So you can do that too. Uh, this next one here is uh, a fume simulations. Everybody likes explosions, or at least I do anyway. So I thought I'd make them. And for the safety of myself and everybody around me, they're fake. So, um, yeah. <laughs> I also do fluid simulations. Um, they're very accurate to actually real world fluids. So um, that's just another example. Uh, 3D tracking and 2D tracking and match moving. So essentially, uh, what that means is, let's say I have video of something, right? and uh, the camera's moving around a lot, and I want to add a, a monster in the scene, right? What I do is I would recreate that camera's motion uh, in the computer, and I would put whatever I want into the scene and not have it slip around all over the place, if that makes sense, right? So I also do cloth simulations. Uh, so this is just a taste of what I can do uh, and what I'm capable of doing. Um, there's a lot more that goes into this. It's a very lengthy process, uh, but I've been doing this for many years, basically my whole life, right? <laughs> so, uh, onto my showreel. I hope it doesn't lag too much, uh, but this is a cl uh, collection of more of the things that I've done. Um, for right here. Excuse the little audio. Don't you just love technology? <laughs> yeah. Remember that thing about the monster? There was a monster in there somewhere. Oh, it cut. Never mind. We'll never know. So, yeah. That's just kind of a little bit. Um, I'm not going to let you guys watch the whole thing. So, on to the kind of development side of things. Um, kind of show you what else is... Uh, I've made a game called Throwball. It's currently available on the App Store. Um, uh, it's basically a 2D physics game where you have to, using a slingshot mechanic, sorry, uh, where you basically have a ball, you drag it, and you have to get it to the goal and avoiding obstacles, essentially. And you have things like black holes, which suck up the ball, so you have to be sure to avoid those. Uh, and you can also, you have to time it just right. So um, uh, it's gotten quite uh, good reviews, actually. I'll read one of them now, uh, just a little bit of it. It said, Throwball is beautifully designed with high quality graphics and a pleasing soundtrack to match. Uh, the soundtrack was done by my father, Charles M. Barnes. He does music. Uh, we actually have a company together, which I will explain here in a little bit. So, thor <laughs> thoroughly enjoyable uh, and more challenging as you make your way through each of the 40 levels. The game is pure joy to play. We'd love to see even more variation in gameplay to take things to the next level. It's perfect for, uh, it's the perfect game for dipping in and out. Um, and this was by uh, Jane Deacon from a website called AppZoom. They were review tons of apps and it got an 8.6 out of 10, which is awesome. So now to the future. Um, I, I've learned so much over my life, right? So this is Film is my life. That's all I've wanted to do ever since I was about the age of five, right? So now I'm at the state where I feel really comfortable with what I know and what I'm capable of. And I think it's time for me to make my first major motion picture. It's called The Great Machine. Uh, it's about a kid named Austin who uh, creates something, who creates a robot that's capable of thinking for itself, for itself, artificial intelligence, right? 
Robots are cool. I love robots. Um, so he, he lives in a not so great neighborhood. Uh, there's a lot of conflict in, in the setting of the movie. And so what, what do you do when you have a robot that's so, that, that learns everything and that's its function? What do you do when it catches up on everything? So what do you do when you make something that's larger than life that starts to become uncontrollable? So, it has, so Austin has to deal with, with loss because he already has little to nothing. And when you make something so great, it's hard to get rid of it. So that's kind of the plot of the film. Uh, and so right now, uh, currently, uh, making a film is no easy task. It's very expensive. There, there's lots of cast and crew involved. So I'm currently trying to raise up $30,000 to get this up and running. Now, what's great is uh, having the experience uh, that I have doing stuff for, for uh, companies and testing out things from here and there, uh, a lot of the what's called the post-production, which is basically where you, you're editing the film, doing the sound design and all that stuff, uh, all that's handled by me. So that cuts the budget basically in half, essentially. So all I'm having to pay for is uh, cast and crew, making sure they get fed, things like that, wardrobe, and uh, make permits for locations, and uh, camera equipment, uh, other rigs and stuff like that. So it's mainly the equipment and uh, a small portion of people. Cast isn't huge. So uh, uh, this is Mobster Hat Media. This is the company that me and my father uh, have started, uh, mobsterhatmedia.com. Uh, we have all of, what you, well, all of what I've shown plus more, and the reel doesn't lag on there, I promise. Um, but uh, this is what we've done. We specialize in uh, film, graphic design, uh, music, sound design, and a whole bunch of other forms of media. Basically, if it has the word media, we do it. Um, so that's, uh, that's me, Jaden Barnes. <laughs> going to open it up for questions. Just remember to say your name and where you're from, and we'll bring the microphone to you. So who wants to kick it off? Tommy Walker, Director of Broadcast for 360 Filmworks. Nice uh, to meet wondering, you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> uh, wondering how old you are, what grade are you in? And uh, once you answer that question, I'd like to invite you to 360 Filmworks anytime you'd like to come by or 2D, 3D animation suite to come by and visit with us. We'd love to have you. Awesome. I'd love to come. Uh, so I'm currently a 12th grade senior. Um, uh, I am actually about to graduate. So I've got three days left. Yeah. Friend Dakota here. He goes to East Tim along with me and my noble class behind you all. So, yeah. Squat. Hi, Joe Calhoun. I'm an intellectual property lawyer here in town. Uh, I didn't get any timeline on, on uh, you, so you're raising for a film. Uh, right. have, you, have you put together any, any offering documents or anything like that? What's your business plan on that? Essentially, so right now, uh, I'm finishing up school, and my goal is to work on that film solely, right? So uh, a lot of ways uh, getting this funded is through doing... Um, work for other people as well to help get the money to actually make this film. So it's kind of a win-win for everyone, right? And for people who are potentially investors, I mean, you get, you get a credit like executive producer in a motion picture, which would hopefully get distributed theatrically, um, as well as most definitely iTunes movies um, and possibly who, you know, so essentially. Yes, sir. Quite a bit. <laughs> Any other questions? Hey, Gary Dowdy with Venture Center. What tools are you doing to do the animation? So, are you using Mac, Windows, and what kind of software? Do you so, use? right now, I've been doing everything on a laptop, uh, on a MacBook Pro. Um, I'm actually getting an upgrade in the next week, so a lot of stuff will be handled a lot faster. But the software I use, uh, Cinema 4D R17, which handles a lot of the 3D stuff. I use pro, uh, plugins for that called Turbulence FD, which is what handles uh, fume simulations like explosions and fire. 
Uh, I also use a program called After Effects, which is a part of the Adobe suite, right? So that would allow me to put things together from the 3D world and the real life world. So making magic. And so Final Cut is to edit. Awesome. You know, there's a guy from Texarkana that did a ton of the graphics on Frozen, Tangled, and a really? bunch of other deals for Disney, Liz, and Fayetteville. So see me after we're done. I'll see if I can we'll do. you. <laughs> Any other questions? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm Kim from One Million Cups. What are your plans for this summer and next year? Uh, essentially, just bringing up that budget, like I said, to um, to to make this movie happen. And I've been, I mean, the the, the story alone has been a year in development. Essentially, uh, uh, I got a guy in Pennsylvania named Martin McGowan. Uh, he's helping me write the script. Uh, I'm also I'm lead writer and co-writer. So uh, essentially, uh, that's my plan to work on that and hopefully get it released in late 2017 or early 2018, somewhere around there. So like a gap year or is college? In okay, so college, uh, I'm not really planning to go, go to college. Now, the reason I'm backing that up is because of the fact that um, uh, I, I've learned so much. There's not much. I've looked into a lot of colleges, don't get me wrong, but there's not much that there's left for me to to learn from them. So, uh, and to back that up, I uh, have a guy, uh, uh, visual effects uh, compositor on Spider-Man 2. Um, he actually has a school, uh, and uh, he, uh, I was talking to him about it, and he, he said, basically, there's not much left I could teach you. You get bored here pretty quickly. Uh, not that I don't want you being here. It's just, you know, I don't, I, we have to make sure everybody's on the same level. So, uh, I've, I've, I'm tired of essentially sitting in a classroom and doing nothing with my life, and I'm ready to actually put all this knowledge that I've gained and putting it into good use by making this motion picture. And it's also a great learning experience and a first-time thing, right? So I, it'll help me understand and overcome challenges that I might face in the future with even bigger projects, essentially. So. All right, so we're going to end this the same way that we did the first presentation. Yeah, what yeah. is one thing the community can do to help you? Uh, essentially, if you have a business, uh, I mean, every business needs a, a marketing video or a commercial or advertisement. So I'm totally capable of doing that work. Um, but also uh, potential investments to help make this film happen with, of course, the executive producer credit and uh, getting you know access to you know any uh, early theatrical releases. So, okay, how can we connect with you if we want to work with you? Uh, Mobster Hat Media, I have contact email on there. Um, so, yeah, Mobster Hat Media, essentially. Cool. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, thank you guys for coming today. Um, so, again, we have this every single Wednesday at 9 a.m. at the Venture Center. Um, no co working today. Any other announcements? Um, I think we still have coffee in the back. Oh, I wanted to thank the Venture Center, um, my co-organizer, Iana Mitchell, um, and thank everyone for coming out today. If you want to present or know someone who might want to present, just contact one of us and we'll get you on the schedule. And thanks for coming. <laughs>